Good morning. No, I am not Clayton Gessel. <laughs> For him, that he's not me. Um, I'm going to be reading today from uh, Hebrews chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Um, I'll be in the New King James Version. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you are our high priest, Lord, that you intercede for us, Lord, that you know our worries, our cares, you know the things and issues that we deal with, Lord. You can relate to our problems, Lord. I'm thankful, Lord, that even though you were our high priest, Lord, you humbled yourself and went to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. And there you just showed us your grace, your mercy, and your love. I pray, Lord, that you be with us now, Lord, during this service. I pray that you be with Pastor Tim, Lord, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you would give him the words to say, Lord, that you would open our hearts, Lord, to your amazing grace, Lord, open our hearts and our ears to the message that you have prepared him to uh, speak to us today, Lord, that we can apply it to our lives, Lord. And I just pray for each and every one in this congregation, Lord, that you would be with us this week, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. All right, if you want to open up uh, to Hebrews 6, where uh, Brother John was reading, uh, Hebrews 6, and eventually we're going to get to Hebrews 6, 9, so if that's where you want to go, I, I believe that's page 1004 in your pew Bible, if that's helpful. Hmm. I just want to take just a moment, a uh, little housekeeping here to uh, thank you for your encouragement and your prayers as far as uh, my other job, as I like to refer to it, uh, goes. Uh, it's posing some interesting challenges for us as a congregation, but they aren't over, they're not insurmountable challenges. They're just challenges um, to my schedule on Sunday morning. So there are times when I won't be here uh, more frequently than you're used to, more frequently than I'm used to. It's just the way that it's, it's got to be for a season. I don't know how long that season will be. But I, I just in, encourage you to uh, continue to come on Sunday mornings, even if I'm not here. Um, come on Sunday evenings. We're going to have the Lord's open the door for Sunday evening services at 530. That's a, that's a blessing. Uh, we're grateful for that. Um, well, I'm grateful for it. And, and uh, attendance was good last week. We'll see how God blesses that and what he wants to do. But what's going to happen in the interim is uh, weeks when I'm not here, which won't be frequent, but just more frequent, is we'll have guest speakers, other pastors, other ordained men coming to, to preach the word. And I, I encourage you, Tim won't do it every week. I wouldn't want to burden him with that, that every, every time thing. He does a great job and we're thankful for him. Thank you, Tim. But we don't want to burden him with that every week. So uh, there will be other men coming. And I encourage you for this. Um, as other men stand in the pulpit, and I want you to do the same thing that you do with me. Weigh what they say against the word of God. <laughs> you know? I, I by no means expect that you take everything that I say that comes out of my mouth without biblical reflection and just embrace it as truth. My, we want to be very Berean. Does everyone know what I mean when I say be Berean about the word? Uh, the Bereans weighed what Paul had to say against the word of God that they had, and they judged whether or not that was right and whether it was true. Please do that. The, 
not, I, I know the men that are going to be coming, um, and they're, they're godly men, and they're good preachers, and, and they know the word of God, but the enemy infiltrates the church with false teaching. That, that's what he does. And in order to protect the church against that, God has given each of us the Holy Spirit, each of us who's a believer. Amen? Isn't that right? So as we meditate on the Word of God, as the Holy Spirit guides and directs us, we can know truth from error. Just be very Berean. Be very discerning. Uh, when I'm here or anyone is in the pulpit, please don't be held under the sway of entertainment or the sway of emotional manipulation to make you buy into something that doesn't quite sound right. Uh, we have a lot of mature believers here. and I, I'm so thankful for our church. We have men and women of God in this place that know the Word of God very well. And we're thankful for that. That's a protecting... God uses that to protect the church. So when I can't be here, it's not like I'm turning the pulpit over to a bunch of heretics. These are godly guys. I, I've, one of the gentlemen who's coming, uh, Roy Worley, he's going to be coming uh, in the next two Sundays that I miss. Uh, he and I co-pastored a church together. I uh, trust him. You know, and the, these, are good, these are good things. Dr. Dan Eddington will take two weeks. Uh, we come to church to be equipped for the good works that God has prepared for us to do in advance. Amen? Isn't that right? So be, be equipped. Uh, do what we read about in, in, in Hebrews 2. You know? uh, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Right? We want to be anchored in the Word of God. So please uh, come, be fed, be edified, be discerning. Come on Sunday nights. So whoever is speaking the Word of God, that you're able to weigh it. Uh, that may feel like instability, but it's, it's not instability, really. It's instability in our eyes. It's not instability in God's kingdom. There, God's kingdom is not unstable. It's not unshakable. It's perfectly ordered, <laughs> right? Uh, God's not caught off guard by anything. And He wants to edify and build up His bride, which is the church, and that's us. So we need to be attentive and apt students of the Word. Uh, over the last two Sundays I did preach, I know I've missed the last two, but we worked our way through a very difficult passage of Scripture. It's difficult to interpret out of context. It's impossible. In context, it's not that hard to interpret. And, and it was Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 8, which when taken out of context seems to indicate that the truly regenerate, those who are actually born again, can either renounce or walk away from or somehow lose their salvation. Um, we demonstrated, though, through the context of the rest of the passage, even the rest of that chapter proves that that's not true. <laughs> but we did that through uh, the rest of the chapter, through other supporting scriptures, through the oracles of God, that that's demonstratively untrue, that you can't lose your salvation when you're generally born again. When I say the oracles of God, scripture references the oracles of God. The oracles of God is the whole counsel of God's Word. It's not the Logos of God. It's, it's not necessarily the, the written Word. It's everything the written Word says together as a whole. Those are the oracles of God. In other words, what point is God making? That's the oracle. So don't separate the oracle from the Word, but don't understand them as exactly the same exact thing. They're, they're not quite. Everything in God's counsel, everything from Genesis to Revelation tells us that we are sinners, we are born separated from God, that God came in flesh, died on the cross, paid the price for our sins, everyone who will confess Him, so that when we confess Him, He washes us clean in His blood, He regenerates us by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, He seals us with the Holy Spirit, which is the promise of our coming salvation, and He goes to prepare a place for us in glory. Amen! That's the Gospel! That's the whole counsel of the Word of God. That's everything from Genesis to Revelation. To say that that's shakable, to say that somehow once God has chosen to redeem us and has done so, that we can lose that? That speaks against the very character of God. It speaks against the very nature of the oracles of God and everything in Scripture. We are so secure, you guys. We read Hebrews chapter 6, we're like, man, could we lose ourselves? No, it wasn't written so that we could doubt. It was written so that we could believe. All of Scripture is written so that we can be sure. John's entire gospel, he says it in there, was written so that we may know that we are saved, that we may know the way to righteousness, that we may know the truth. Salvation through Christ is anchored in the saving work accomplished by Jesus Christ. It's anchored in His eternal life. It's anchored in His eternal kingship. And it's anchored in 
His eternal priesthood, which He will never give up. You can only lose genuine salvation if your genuine Savior stops existing. Amen? We're anchored in Him. He's the anchor of our salvation. You can trust that you're saved because you can trust in your Savior. Amen? Isn't that true? Isn't that great to be part of the body of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of believers, sure about our salvation? So, on the heels of describing in Hebrews chapter 6 what it looks like when people profess to be Christians but aren't, and that's what those verses are about, the writer sets out to encourage genuine believers. He brings confidence, not doubt, to the game. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. Hebrews 6, verses 9 through 12. The writer of Hebrews says this, though we speak in this way, in other words, he's just recounted what it looks like for false believers. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation, to genuine salvation. Genuine salvation looks like something. For God's not unjust so as to overlook your works and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. That's what Christ is looking for. He wants us to be confident. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. All right. So what is he saying here in verses 11 and 12? We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have a full assurance of hope until the end. He wants the hearers of this to live in assurance of their salvation, to walk boldly, and confidently, with their head held high, doing good works in Jesus' name, not being sluggish. Why, why would we be sluggish? Because we doubt. We're sluggish because, oh, I sinned. Maybe God's not pleased with me. Oh, I sinned. Maybe I'm not worthy. Oh, I've sinned. Maybe I shouldn't try to speak the name of the Lord Jesus because I'm not perfect. That is a false gospel. Jesus is perfect. We don't talk about us. We talk about him. Amen. Isn't it beautiful? We talk about the perfect one, the people who need the perfect one to save their souls. And we relate to them earnestly, energetically, confidently that Jesus will save you too. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. We implore you in the name of the living God, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that our message? Not once in there did I say, like Tim Philkins. And that's important. Because if I'm trying to make little me's, I'm not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm sharing some weird religious thing where I want people to do like I do. (laughs) Not so much. That's not what Paul says, and it's not what the writer of Hebrews says. Your anchor in eternity is not in your ability to keep the law, so don't be sluggish. Take risks. Amen. Share your faith when you're nervous to share your faith. Isn't that right? Who's ever been afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing? What can you say? That's so wrong. Do you know who Jesus is? Yes. Do you know what he did on the cross? Yep. Do you know that you are the beneficiary of the saving blood of Jesus Christ? Yep. Confident about that. You don't need anything else. You just tell people about that. You tell people about him. How could you possibly mess that up? The only way you can mess it up is to say, go worship someone else besides Jesus. That's not going to come out of your mouth. Not having every answer isn't failing. Amen. Who's who's glad about that? Not having every answer isn't failing. Having a genuine testimony about genuine conversion. I've said this before, I'm going to say it one more time. I don't have to study at night to prepare to tell people about my wife. You ever thought about that? If someone at work asked me about, hey, who's this lady you're married to? What's she like? I don't have to go, "Uh uh-oh, freeze up. Um, Well... And the reason we get like that is because we're thinking their eternity hangs in the balance on my answer. Right? Isn't that right? So when I'm describing Christina, no one's eternity is hanging in the balance. I'm like, oh, she's great. She's this. She's beautiful. She's this. She's that. She's smart. Oh, yeah. She's all right. But but somehow when we start to talk about Jesus, we're like, oh, their entire eternity hangs in the balance, and it's up to me to save them. It's not up to you. If, someone's put, if Jesus Christ has put someone in your path to share the gospel, just share it. The saving is up to whom? Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So just be faithful in your testimony. All right. 
So Jesus anchors you in eternity when you're hearing or their hearing of the gospel is joined with faith. And we'll look, we, you'll remember this from Galatians 3, 1 through 6. Uh, we just preached through Galatians not long ago. O foolish Galatians, Paul says, who's bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. This is the key question for salvation losers, people that think you can lose. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Think about that. How were you saved? By doing good stuff? No. You heard the gospel and it was united in you with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, faith, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, now that you've been saved, do you now have to live according to the law in order to be pleasing to God? Or did He save you and make you pleasing to Him? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was, it was in vain? Does He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The answer to that is faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Trusting in Jesus Christ accredits his righteousness to you. It's simple. One plus one equals two. Jesus plus faith equals salvation. It's, it, it's not complicated, but somehow we get it all twisted. So we're going to take a look at two things this morning that anchors us in, in that type of faith. First is God's promise, and second is Jesus' permanent priesthood. Let's look at the promise first. Let's look at Hebrews 6, verses 13 through 18. For when God made a promise to Abraham, and Brother John just read this, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. It's uh, interesting when I go to court to testify now. When I first started on the job, when you would go to court to testify, they had a Bible in the courtroom. And before you would testify, you'd have to raise your right hand and put your hand on that Bible. And they say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And you would say, I do. Some people lie when they do that, Some people, but you would say, I do. You're swearing by something greater than yourself, that you're going to tell the court the truth. You know what happens now? They'll say, who's going to testify? And they put your hands up, and you all put your hands up. No Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? That's it. You're not swearing by anything greater than yourself. You say, you say, I do. But I like to say, <laughs> so help me God, I do. Which freaks out the defense attorney a little bit. <laughs> Which is good. You, want, you don't want them on their toes. You want them rocked a little bit. <laughs> so help me God, I do. But that says something that reminds me. No matter the potential good in my mind of bending the truth a little bit or exaggerating just a little bit to get a conviction, no matter what I think might be good by lying, to do so discredits my Lord. See? To say anything other than the truth discredits my Lord. I do that enough when I don't intend to. I'm not going to stand up and proclaim his name and then do it. So I just say it because it, it reminds me. Man, we represent the Lord Jesus Christ in the world, right? Now, we don't live by the law to get saved, but shouldn't we live by the law because we're saved? Shouldn't we honor Him in everything we say? Shouldn't we honor Him in everything we do? Shouldn't we honor Him in every relationship? Shouldn't we strive to keep the Ten Commandments? Shouldn't we strive to have no other God before Him? Shouldn't we strive not to bear false witness? Shouldn't we not covet what someone else has and be willing to do anything to get what they got? Shouldn't we live according to the Ten Commandments? And shouldn't that bring us joy because when we do, we know we're being pleasing to our Father. Isn't that how we should live? That's how we should live. Joyfully keeping the law. The law that used to convict us now frees us to live a righteous life in His name. Man. But what's this promise? I swore on the Bible in court. Now I swear 
by God's name before I testify, but let's look at this again, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Let's look at this promise. Let's go back to Genesis 22. Keep your finger here, we're going to be back in Hebrews, but Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18 Everyone there? Okay. After these things, you have to read the first 21 chapters to know what these things were. Don't worry about that, okay? After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Here I am. And when we get saved, isn't that what we say? Here I am. People say, I've given my life to Jesus. But I don't really like how this life's going. Hey, you gave your life to Jesus. You trusted him with the rest of it. Nothing is by accident. Did you really surrender? If you really surrendered, then can't you take joy even in your trials? Can't you understand that God has this set up this way on purpose for great kingdom things? Do you trust him? Do you trust him? I surrender all. Do you? Really? Because I said I surrender all, and i got to tell you, I gripe a lot. Amen? Who's ever heard me just gripe? Some of you heard me gripe. This is going, rah, rah, what about this? Rah, 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 rah. Aren't you the sovereign God? Why do I have to catch every red light? Who's ever said something like this? Wouldn't it make sense from a human perspective that all Christians would have a green light every intersection? <laughs> Never be late, no traffic. Because he, he did the Red Sea thing, Remember? He can do the traffic thing. The Eden's Expressway is nothing for God. He did the Red Sea thing. But anyway, but we don't surrender. But here says Abraham, I, here I am. Meaning, whatever you got next, here I am. We need to struggle for that in our Christian walk. To be there. Here I am, Lord. To wake up each morning, here I am. Sometimes we wake up in the midst of trouble. Amen? Who's... Who's ever worried about something in the night and then you wake up and you're still worried? You're almost in the same worry place in the morning because it's such a huge event. That's human. But we need to say, put our feet on the floor and say, here I am. I stand on the promise of Christ. Anyway, wait till you see what's coming next. You're like, we'll get to it then. Okay, verse 2. He said, take your son your only son Isaac, whom you love, that's important, don't forget that. Abraham loved Isaac. He was the child of promise. He was the hope. God had told him, you're not going to give your kingdom to some loosely related relative. You're going to have a son. And Isaac was the answer to all those prayers and all those promises. So he's Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. Don't gloss over that. What if God asked that of you? Man, my kids are precious, amen? Amen. They're grown and they don't smell good like babies anymore and all that stuff, you know. They argue a lot now. They have their own opinions now and they, and they, they want driver's licenses, these people. And, uh, but I love them. Don't you love them? If, can you imagine? Here I am, Lord. Go sacrifice your son. But remember what Jesus said in Luke 24. All of the law, which this is, and the prophets, and the Psalms were written about me. Okay? God sent His only Son whom He loves. Do you understand how much the Father loves the Son? Do you, can you get your mind around how much God the Father loves God the Son? perfect unity for eternity they didn't need us they didn't create us to fulfill some void in their relationship they 
created us for his glory. Amen? You were created for the glory of God, not because he was needy. Take your son, your only son, the son you love, and sacrifice him where I tell you. Verse 3. So Abraham didn't say forget that like Jonah and run. Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now he's old. He's old here, right? He's 100 when Isaac was born. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Would you be in a worship mindset if God told you, I'm going to, you need to go sacrifice your son, I'll tell you where, start walking. And then you see it. Put yourself there. Think of the feeling. There it is. That's the place I'm going to be called to make the ultimate sacrifice. We think the ultimate sacrifice is our own lives, but it's not, is it? Who's ever said, I'd, let, I'd die for you, baby? Anyone ever said anything like that? That's the easy part. It's easy to die for somebody. What's hard is living with them, right? You die for them, it's over. Woohoo! Great. He died for me. That's fantastic. No, you gotta you live. That's what marriage is. I die for you. Fantastic. Let's get married. But now I'm gonna live with you for you for the rest of my days. That's the hard part, right? The ultimate sacrifice is giving up what you love. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, verse 4, and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy. It's young man. He's not a boy. He's grown. We'll go over there and worship and come again to you. What's that? Hope. Right? God who promised me this son and promised a lot of things through this son is asking me to kill this son of mine. I still have faith that he can rectify this situation. Verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. What did Jesus carry through the streets of Jerusalem? The cross beam. Is that not the wood of the burnt offering? And he took in his hand the fire. They carried flaming embers in a thing. He didn't take fire in his hand. He wasn't burning. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they both went both, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, the obvious question, My father... And he said, here I am, my son. He's there for both God and his son, right? Here I am. He said, behold, look, we got fire, we got wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood on the altar and bound Isaac, his son. Can you imagine building that altar? And tying up your boy? How hard was it for God? To watch Jesus walk through Jerusalem in Passion Week. He'd built the altar on Calvary already. That week was binding up his son. He turned his son over to the hands of evil men to be bound and beaten and marched off like a criminal to the very place he would save the world. Do you see how these things fit together? Do you see why these stories are in the Bible? Verse 9. 
Verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told them. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood on the altar and bound Isaac his son. That took Isaac's compliance. Isaac was grown. His dad was 120 years old. He could have easily overpowered his dad and ran. He could have easily have said, I'm not getting on there. But he didn't. He allowed his father to bind him and place him on the altar. Is that not Jesus Christ? Who willingly went to the cross for me and you? Who for the joy set before him endured the shame? Not his shame. Yours. Mine. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. That word slaughter means slay, make sacrifice, kill. But at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. That's the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. God's not making you pay for your sins. He switched it out and paid for it himself. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only begotten son, from me. The child of miraculous birth. Abram's wife was 90 when she had Isaac. That's impossible, you guys. Even then, that was impossible. Isaac, who's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, was born to a woman who couldn't have kids. That's just like Mary, who had a miraculous child. Amen? Isn't that right? Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. God offered up his son instead of us. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. You may know that as Jehovah Jireh. Who's ever heard Jehovah Jireh before? God the provider, God the provider. He provided the sacrifice for your sins so that you don't go to a sinner's hell. That's what Jehovah Jireh means. It's nothing about cars and relationships. It's about the living God dying on a cross for you so that you could be redeemed. Amen. God the provider. Don't let people profane the name of God. When you hear take the Lord's name in vain, you probably think of whacking your thumb with a hammer and yelling out Jesus' name. But when people say God exists to meet every one of your felt needs, they are taking the Lord's name in vain. He does not exist to serve you. We exist to serve Him. When we turn it around, we're taking the Lord's name in vain. So Aaron called in the name of that place the Lord will provide. It is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Here it is. Here's the promise. It took us a long time to get here. I think it was a good trip, but it took us a long time to get here. Ready? Here's the promise. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That's the promise. God swore by himself, I will do this. And let's take a look at that promise one more time. I read it quickly. We went through it. Uh, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. 
That's us, saints. When you read in Isaiah, and Isaiah is lamenting the Messiah being murdered on the, on the cross. And he says, and oh for his generations. Meaning, he didn't have any offspring on the earth because he was taken away. He was taken out of this world. But Jesus does have generations and generations and generations and generations of family after him. Amen? It's us. It's the redeemed. It's those who will call in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is, his, we are his family. We are his children. We are adopted through faith in Christ. We don't deserve it, but he gave it to us as gifts. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Verse 18, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's the great commission. That's the great commission. Go therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Lo, I am, behold, I am with you until the very end of the age. Amen. Old Testament prophecy about New Testament stuff. Scripture's full of it. Good stuff. Scripture's full of good stuff. Good prophecy. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Saints, it is up to us to carry the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ into every nation, into every workplace, into every family gathering. When I think of the times I've spent gathering with my family doing worthless stuff, wasting time, when I could be edifying them with the greatness and the glories of God, but I'd rather watch Thor, false god. Man, not that you can't have fun. Please don't take from me the idea that Christians can't have fun and we got to walk around like we're baptizing lemon juice and we got to always have a frown on our face and we can't listen to rock music and we can't listen to this and we can't go there and we can't watch that. Please don't hear me saying that because that's, that, that's not what I mean. But I mean the frivolous, wasting away of time in community with my family where there's no really benefit, we're just lollygay, and I'm not, I don't have the glories of God. All I got to do is look out my back window and watch that squirrel running across that branch and leap from one tree to another. Who's ever seen that before? Isn't that the coolest thing? It's a little tiny branch, and they got the big fuzzy tail, and, it's a, and they jump, and that tail is like a rudder, and it just keeps them straight, and their body's perfectly straight, and they just grab onto the little branch and go, man, that is a glory of God manifest glory of God manifest. You watch the sunset? That is the glory of God manifest. Son, look at that. Look at what God has wrought. Amen, right? It, you don't have to preach a sermon every five seconds, but certainly have something about the Lord on your lips somewhere. Hey, 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 daughter, I was just reading this. Come look at this. I was just reading through the Psalms. I've read it a thousand times. Listen to this. God's people ought to be joyful. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We should be celebrating our King. And even in the midst of trials, when you can't have a smile on your face, because please don't have a fake smile on your face. That's worse than not having a smile on your face. When you're suffering and you go to your brothers and sisters in humility and say, I just need prayer. I'm really hurting right now. It's a test of my faith. I'm, I, sometimes I just feel like I'm losing my faith. Has anyone ever been there? I thought God promised. And I feel like he's reneging on his promise. And we come together and we're able to comfort one another in the word of the Lord and say, don't give up faith. One, you can't because God's holding it in his hand. You can't really give up faith. But don't, don't let this challenge you that way. God is good. He's good and he's got you and I'm here and we're all here and we're not going to let you go because we love you and we love you because he's commanded it and we love you because we share in one baptism, one Lord, one faith. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We aren't going anywhere. No matter how much of a nitwit you act like, we aren't going anywhere. Shouldn't that be how the church is? You can't shake us. You think you've offended us to the point where we don't love you anymore? You look in your rear mirror, we're going to be driving behind you praying for you. We're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. You're not going to anger me enough that I just, 
you need help and I'm not going to give it. I, it it's, it's not going to happen. Why? Because we love Christ. We love Christ. Also, don't hear me saying you can't be mad at anybody. <laughs> you can't. You, but working through anger and working through hardship and working through those things builds us stronger. Okay. I'm going to close. With, we're going to go to one more place. Jesus is the ram in the thicket here. And I think this will be a good place to close. Can you turn over with me to 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20? 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. In your pew Bible, it's page 964. Second Corinthians 1, verse 20 through 22. Two short verses, and then we'll pray and go. Second Corinthians 1, 20 to 22. Paul has just spoken to the Corinthians. And some of them have charged him with being wishy-washy, saying one thing, meaning another, saying he's coming when he doesn't. And so, Anyway, so he answers with this. Verse 20, and this is so key. All of the promises of God find their yes in him. That's Jesus Christ. Every promise God made about our eternity is yes in Jesus Christ. Every promise God made about your eternity is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's yes. For all have the promises of God find their yes in him. This is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Notice we don't utter our amen to God for his glory because everything's going right. Notice it doesn't say that. That's why it is through him that we utter our amen to God's glory. Verse 21, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee of our salvation. Do not doubt your salvation. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are born again. You ain't going nowhere except heaven. All right? Amen? Amen. Amen.